Hello, welcome to this video covering one of the most important tracts, the corticospinal tract, and we need to talk about the anatomy that we're going to cover today. We're going to start off our journey in the cerebral cortex, travel through the midbrain, go through the pons, and we are going to go through the medulla oblongata. From there, we are going to enter into the spinal cord and see how the tract innovates muscle to initiate and control voluntary movement, we'll mainly be focusing on the lateral corticospinal tract. So the lateral corticospinal tract is 85% of the fibers and these go to the limbs. There is of course an anterior corticospinal tract which goes to axial muscle groups and trunk muscle groups for stability and balance. So to help us along the way, we're going to use this graphic, which shows exactly where we are anatomically as we journey down through these cross sections. And we need to now start thinking about the origin of those upper motor neurons. So this pathway, the lateral corticospinal tract is a two neuron pathway. It has an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. The cell bodies of the upper motor neuron are located in the cerebral cortex. Now, it makes perfect sense to think that the majority of those neurons are originating from an area known as the primary motor cortex. And in fact, many of them do. But many of them also come from other regions as well, including the association motor cortex, which is usually responsible, I guess, for planning of motor movement and also and this may come as a bit of a surprise, some of those neurons are going to originate from the primary sensory cortex. So what on earth are those neurons doing coming from the primary sensory cortex? So here we can bring on our origin. This is the cerebral cortex, and we will bring up the upside down half humunculus, which is the representation of the primary motor cortex, where a lot of these neurons are going to come from. OK, so this is a representation of the cortex, which is disproportionate in size, which is why the hands and the face are different in proportion to the rest of the body, because this particular pathway is about motor units, not the size of muscles. So those regions of the body that have a greater number of motor units will have more precise and fine control coming from the lateral corticospinal tract. But what about those sensory neurons leaving the primary sensory cortex and descending down into the cord? What are they doing? Well, their job is to ramify onto synapses inside the dorsal horn, and their job is to amplify, accentuate signals relating to proprioception. Proprioception is the most important sensory signal that facilitates movement because it tells the brain about limb position and muscle tone within the limbs. And this is really important. So this needs to be prioritized while movement is taking place. So that leaves us with the neurons leaving directly from the association motor cortex. Research suggests that the neurons leaving directly from here are involved in a suppressor action. We must understand that when voluntary movement is initiated, we end up having to also suppress unwanted movements. It's not just enough to initiate the movement you want. So there is some inhibitor function here, and this is also part of the role of aspects of the extrapyramidal pathways. So now we know the origin of our upper motor neurons. Their axons travel through this region, which is known as the corona radiata. This is myelinated axons in between the cortex and the brainstem. And we can see them represented here on this graphic alongside the primary sensory cortex and the primary motor cortex. Now these fibers will converge and they will travel through a very distinctive region of the cerebrum called the internal capsule. And we are gonna take a bit of a closer look at that now. We can see on the graphic it going through there. And we're gonna bring up a zoomed infographic which will show us that structure in a bit more detail. So here we have a transverse representation showing that area. We have the thalamus placed medially. We have structures belonging to the basal ganglia, including the putamen. We have the head of the chordate nucleus, and we have components of the globus pallidus, so they're all basal ganglia, and then 
Laterally to that, we have a structure called the claustrum. Now, in the middle of that and squeezed in between it is a kind of thoroughfare of white matter, and that is the internal capsule. And in particular, the lateral corticospinal tract is going to run through this shaded region, which is the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So from here, those fibers will journey and descend further into the midbrain, which we can see here. And again, we're going to bring up a transverse section to show that through the midbrain, they are going anteriorly through the cerebral cruse. And that's important clinically to know that these fibers are traveling in the anterior portion of the brainstem. So we're at the level of the midbrain, which we can see here on the graphic. And from here, we are going to descend from the midbrain down into the ponds. They continue to travel anteriorly. And we can see them here represented anteriorly in the ponds. We can see some other structures at this level, including the nucleus of the facial nerve and abducent nerve and other things going on in relation to connections to the cerebellum. So our tract is now at the level of the ponds and it is going to then descend even further down into the brainstem into the medulla oblongata. So this is where we get some changes occur and we're going to zoom in on this area because it's important. This area is where we get crossing over. So it's this anatomical location that represents the crossing of 85% of the fibers that form the lateral corticospinal tract. The remaining 15% travel uncrossed at this stage as part of the anterior corticospinal tract. So let's take a look at the medulla. It's got the pons on there as well. So let's just label the pons very, very quickly. But the structures that we are interested in are in the medulla and we can see an anterior view here. Uh, first of all, we will label on the structure known as the olives. So the olives are prominent on the anterior medulla, but we are interested in the structures placed a little bit more medially here which are the pyramids now at the inferior portion of the pyramids that's where we get crossing over of those 85 percent of the fibers forming the lateral corticospinal tract so the terminology here is called decussation that's just another word for crossing over of the tract so now our lateral corticospinal tract has crossed and those fibers are now going to descend on the opposite side of the spinal cord and they will continue in the cord to various levels where they will ramify onto the cell bodies of lower motor neurons and it's these lower motor neurons that are going to leave the spinal cord to innovate muscle. So now we can bring on a cross section of the spinal cord and look at what happens when those upper motor neurons connect with lower motor neurons. So here we've got a transverse section. The region in blue is actually sensory pathways. We're not worried about those. We're worried about the ones in red, which are the descending motor tracks. And the one that we are most interested in is this one, which is the representation of the lateral corticospinal tract inside the cord. And this travels in an area of the white matter known as the lateral funiculus. And that's quite important clinically to understand where that is, helps us appreciate what happens when there's damage to specific regions of the cord. So now we're gonna try and draw on what happens when we get the upper motor neuron coming out at segmental level of that bundle and traveling to the gray matter. It's gonna to travel to the anterior horn of the gray matter and it's going to synapse on the cell bodies of lower motor neurons. And here we can see the lower motor neuron in green and it's going to leave through the anterior spinal rootlets. And we can see that happening now and that's going to travel into the periphery and end up innovating muscle. So remember, this is a two neuron pathway. There's an upper motor neuron, which is an alpha motor neuron. And in the lateral corticospinal tract, the lower motor neuron is also an alpha motor neuron because this is going to cause contraction of voluntary muscle. Now, 
something that is often drawn on at this stage is an interneuron connecting the upper motor neuron with the lower motor neuron. I haven't done that here and neither is an interneuron recognized or included in the total number of neurons in the pathway. It remains a two neuron pathway regardless of whether an interneuron connects them or not at segmental level. So we now have a lower motor neuron that's in green and we can see that here leaving the cord and that's going to travel into the periphery and innervate muscle and at the level of which it innervates muscle is known as the neuromuscular junction so we can put on a graphic here now showing what the neuromuscular junction would look like here is the nerve innervating the muscle fibers and there we have it. That is the end of our journey of the lateral corticospinal tract. It crosses over in the medulla. It involves 85% of the total amount of fibres belonging to the corticospinal tract. I hope that's been useful for your learning. Don't forget to subscribe and click the notifications icon to make sure that you're updated when we release new videos. Find us on Facebook, Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel to help explain the mysteries of the brain.